Any breatharian? I mean, seriously, you still want to be breatharian? Yes. How about we make a total non-existence of food? The thing is, we have enough food because the whole world eats. The cereal is about 40%, huh? And uh, the soya bean we eat only 10%. And the whole world. So even if you give up the food, and it won't amount to a lot anyway. So just uh, give the body what it needs, yeah? Not too much. Just control what you eat. You can eat anything, just not too overeating. Not the tray like this with mountain of this and hill of that. <laughs> no, if you eat them all, it's okay. If you eat them, <laughs> then it's good. I just don't want you to waste food. The cost of living has gone up also. Yeah, it's true. It's gone up more than we realize. And the world people are still hungry. Not like the food don't have enough because they, they feed it to the hungry people and then so... They were not enough, but it's not true like that. It's true that they fit, you know, a million here and a couple of hundred thousand there, but it's not permanent. The best is that if we don't raise any more livestock, then uh, they have uh, food, just keep it for themselves to eat, so they don't have to sell to the uh, meat industry. That would be the best. Some of the diseases related to meat consumption and or production. Swine flu, Ebola reston virus. Cured meats and fish increase leukemia risk in children. Antibiotic resistant superbug infections from a strain of Staphylococcus aureus. Blue tongue disease, E. coli, salmonella, bird flu, mad cow disease or Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, 90% of the population at risk. Pig's disease, or PMWS, listeriosis, shellfish poisoning, preeclampsia, Campylobacter, Clostridium difficile, diseases hidden in healthy appearing livestock. Some of the costs of meat eating. Infertility. Eating just one serving of meat per day increases the risk of women's infertility by 32%, with additional meat consumption increasing the risk. Heart disease. Over 17 million lives lost globally each year. Cost of cardiovascular disease is at least 1 trillion US dollars a year. Cancer, colon and rectal cancer. Over 1 million new colon cancer patients diagnosed each year. More than 600,000 colon cancer related mortalities annually. In the United States alone, colon cancer treatment costs about 6.5 billion US dollars. Millions of people are newly diagnosed with other meat-related cancers every year. Diabetes. 246 million people are affected worldwide. An estimated 174 billion US dollars spent each year on treatment in just the United States. Obesity. Worldwide, 1.6 billion adults are overweight, with 400 million more who are obese. Costs 93 billion US dollars each year for medical expenses in the United States alone. At least 2.6 million people die annually from problems related to being overweight or obese. Environmental. Use up to 70% of clean water. Pollute most of the water bodies. Deforest the lungs of the earth uses up to 43% of the world's cereal, uses up to 85% of the world's soy, cause world hunger and wars, 80% cause of global warming, plus more. Some of the costs of milk consumption. Bacterial microbes, pesticides and enzymes found in cheese derived from the inner stomach linings of other animals. Up to 80% of the calories in cheese are from pure fat, Breast, prostate and testicular cancer from hormones present in milk. Hysteria and Crohn's disease. Hormones and saturated fat leads to osteoporosis, obesity, diabetes and heart disease. Linked to higher incidences of multiple sclerosis. Classified as a major allergen. Lactose intolerance. Plus more. For more urgent information, please visit www.suprememastertv.com forward slash killers.
Every day I have something to feel sorry about. The bird outside, when I was in the Himalaya, I saw some monkey. Mm, they are going down from the mountain, away from their habitat, and go down and, eat, and foraging the garbage on the street next to the market. Oh, my heart feels so bad. That was before I was even enlightened. I mean, I was still searching and walking different corner of India, and I saw monkey, you know, hungry like that. Normally they have fruit all over in the forest, and they eat and they drink from the stream. That's the way I imagine. I imagine their lives is belong to the jungle, you know, in the forest, and there will be fruits in abundance, and they don't ever have to go to the market eating garbage like that, and not even a lot of garbage to eat. They're just foraging in there. And it feels so painful for me to see such thing. And uh, when I I was recently in Monaco, such a rich and prosperous city, and I saw many of the seagulls and the birds. They went into the also the garbage can in the park, digging their head in it and find a little bit something left over sandwich and they eat it together. If they find some, maybe already not too bad. I'm in pain constantly, watching the way people treat each other and treat other fellow co-inhabitants. When I was in uh, Florida to take my staff out, you know, <laughs> because they like to eat some French fry. But I saw the man, you know, very old, very old, and he walked bending his back, and then he was also foraging the garbage, and he, he took out, you know, a quarter of a cup of a cola, and I began to drink it. And he kept looking for leftover sandwich or something. Oh, I feel so bad, so bad. I could not even cry. I'm just too shocked and too grieving. So I took him in the restaurant, and then... Uh, uh, invite him whatever he wants. And after that, uh, I give him also like uh, four or five hundred dollars. And then we left. And it's not like a very expensive restaurant that nobody could afford to invite the old poor man a meal. Cost maybe ten dollars, five dollars the most. So if I can, I invite him in myself and buy it, order it for him or her. Otherwise, they kick him out. Even then, they kick her out too, and I intervene. I say, she has money. She's a customer. You have to serve her. And then so they did serve her, but reluctantly, you know. And then after that, uh, I took her tray and said, we eat outside. We don't want to sit in here. <laughs> the same restaurant, just eat outside in the garden, you know. And she was eating like she has never seen food for a long time. This kind of thing really is very painful for me to to see, yeah. And the monkeys and you know the birds and all kind of animals that they're, they're hungry also. Human hungry, animals hungry because the karmic pattern of this world is not favorable. You understand me? It breeds this kind of situation like that because it's not Eden. It's not like everybody taking care of everybody else in time of need. I'm sure that man must have been working all his life, or at least some of his life, but uh, the situation there doesn't allow him, and then he lost his house. Sometimes if you lost your job, then you lost your house also because you can't afford to pay every month. You can be late, maybe one month perhaps, I don't know how long they let you be late. But you're, you're late more than that. They just take your house away and take all the possession in your house as well. And there's nothing you can do about it. Is that true? So anyway, sometimes it's like that. If he's fired for some reason or he's sick too long or something and he lost everything, then he became homeless and it could happen to anybody. And. In some places, 
the government do have some kind of homeless shelter, right? For the minimum things, yeah. But not every place have that, and it's mostly full, right? So it's not like easy to get in, and you can't stay long. You got to get a job quick. But mostly, if you don't have the house, then you don't have a job. You don't have an address, you know? <laughs> you can't write out no address and homeless, they won't let you. Because they will send the application to you, they will send all kind of thing to you, whether you're okay to work, etc., etc. And if you don't have a house, then you don't have a job. And if you don't have a job, then you don't talk about the house. So it's like a devil's circles, you know? So I'm telling you, uh, on one hand, sometimes we're together, we're happy and all that, and I forget about it. But at night, when I'm all alone and I'm thinking of all this situation, think of all the cold and hungry animals and human beings, and I feel really, really so sad, so sad. I, the way you know we treat each other and the way we treat our co-inhabitants is truly not ideal. Not if we want to truly have a happiness on this planet. Not if we really want to have a peaceful world in which we will enjoy. So I uh, sometimes don't understand humans' mentality and how they think and how it works. The social system, the policy of the planet as a whole, you know? Every country is a little different, but some countries are better than others. But still you can find even the richest countries still have this kind of problem, that people have no home, nowhere to go, families scattered and broken because nowhere to go, and children go hungry, cannot go to school because no home, etc., etc. It's just very, very painful sometimes to watch, yeah? I do what I can, but it's never enough, because this is a system that we have yeah, in this world. It's not just one or two cases, it's the whole system. And I just hope one day, if uh, everyone returns to their greatness, yeah, think about how great they want to represent themselves on this planet, then uh, maybe we will have a better society. It's not just uh, like sharing the food only, it's just sharing everything. Technology help the people to help themselves. And if we are not eating meat, then the world will become better already. Yes, that means the society as a whole has become more compassionate. Then the system will be different. We change, yeah? The mentality we change, and the policy of the planet we change. And then we will help each other, not just distributing food, like charity act, but distributing technology, yeah? Seeds, uh, helping with all kinds of things, conserving the whole resource of the planet so that everybody has a chance to use it to help themselves. I think everybody would love to serve themselves, not want to just uh, take the hand out, you know, in a refugee camp somewhere, dirty, chaotic, and no water, no food, and just waiting for a hand out every day. That is not the way everyone would want to live his or her life, yeah? It's not the dignity. So the system has to change, and it begins with being vegetarian begins with vegetarian, because people, if they want to save the planet, if they want to save the animal, then the compassion comes out. And then when the compassion envelops the whole planet, then the energy will change completely. Then everybody will bathe in it, and every day they will think differently, they will act differently, and their mind will be more clarified, and they can think of a better system, how to distribute wealth and resources, which belong to everybody anyway. Either you stay in Africa, you're born in Ethiopia, you're born in England, it's the same. We have not brought any resource with us the day we are born. 
So the resource of the world belong to everybody, but we don't distribute it well. The able one take it more than give it. That's the problem, more than sharing it. So I do hope one day the whole planet will wake up and think of how we want to live our life, you know? Not the life that we have been living up to now. I mean, most of it is not always what we can be proud of, yes. And when we die, we have nothing anyway. <laughs> we came with nothing, we will go with nothing. But meanwhile, everybody tried to take what they can, and therefore we are short. Some are taking too much, some are having none. And because the more we eat meat, the more we have to deforest, yes? And the more resource we need, more meat, more land we use, more deforestation, more fuel needed to process, to transport, more uh, resource needed for medicine, for facilities, medical facilities, for all kind of a new, new invention of medicine because new disease come out all the time. And the old one, we have not found a cure yet, the old new one already come. Because of this kind of bad energy will breed more bad virus, bacteria, and we can never keep up with it. And then more hospital, more experiments, uh, vivisection, and more suffering for animals also, in all kinds of things. Not just killing them only, you know, suffering in the laboratory and all that. It's beyond my imagination how we can treat anyone or any animal this way. Some of the benefits of a vegetarian diet lowers blood pressure, lowers cholesterol levels, reduces type 2 diabetes, prevents stroke conditions, reverses atherosclerosis, reduces heart disease risk 50%, reduces heart surgery risk 80%, prevents many forms of cancer, stronger immune system, increases life expectancy up to 15 years, higher IQ, saves 70% of the total cost of 40 trillion US dollars for reducing global warming, uses 4.5 times less land to grow food, conserves up to 70% clean water, saves 80% of the cleared Amazonian rainforest from animal grazing, a solution for world hunger, free up 3.4 billion hectares of land, free up 760 million tons of grain every year, half the world's grain supply, consumes one-third fossil fuels of those used for meat production, reduces pollution from untreated animal waste, maintains cleaner air, saves 4.5 tons of emissions per U.S. household per year, stop 80% of global warming, Plus more. Save your life. Be veg. Go green. So even if you are not breatharian or anything, you can try now and again to go without food for a while and see how it goes. Sometimes if you can go as far as like two weeks or something, you feel good. But don't go too far, okay? I don't advise. You go as far as your body can bear. And don't get yourself sick, because everybody's faith and uh, determination and mind power is different, okay? So you don't test yourself too far, okay? When I tried it myself, uh, the first time, I did not do it on purpose, but I normally eat only once a day. That was a long time ago. And then the first time I tried it, I didn't even prepare in advance, you know? I just quit some weeks and I feel so good, I did not feel any desire for food or nothing. I feel so light, like I was flying on the cloud all the time. And just because everybody was looking and asking all the time and I feel like sticking out like a sore thumb, so I went back to the food and it wasn't very pleasing to me and I feel like I have descended from the cloud. The first meal I, I tasted again, that was it. Just different mentality and I just feel like I fell down. And later on, when I tried to do it deliberately sometimes, for some reason, you know, some inner urge to do, 
if you can do it after a couple of weeks, you know, or several weeks, you feel really in control. Yeah, you just drink juice or maybe water. Yes, it depends. And then uh, you feel like that's it. You never fear anything. Even if you go without food, nothing you cannot do. You know, you don't need food. It's a feeling like that. But you try as much as your body can take and your mental capability can take. Everyone is different, yeah? Apart from the affinity with food, yes, there's also a level of consciousness and a mind power as well. So don't make yourself sick, okay? Just in case you don't have any food to eat and you just have to go breatharian, believe in the divine power. Walk a lot in the sun, in the fresh air, yeah? Walk a lot on the ground, no shoes. Believe in all this will sustain you, and it will. You have the system inside to renew yourself anyway. Just that we have forgotten it, yeah? But you can use it again in case of emergency only, okay? And when you have food, you enjoy it. Uh, The first few days, you would think nothing but food. But after a while, you know, you get used to it. And if your faith is strong, you can just go without. Okay? If your mind is so strong. Because we are the temple of God. There's nothing we cannot do, truly. Just we have to reprogram our thinking and re-educate our body uh, function, yeah? All the cells in the body has to understand what we want now because the cells are used to it, you know, taking food and solid and from outside already. So it takes some time to re-educate it. It takes reinforcement every day, every day. Yeah. Every time you forget it, you remind yourself. You don't have to talk loud. You can also. But what do you think the cells will take note? And sometimes they immediately obey. Yes. But don't try too far. You have to have a good motivation why you don't want to eat. Not just for show and let everybody think you're holy. If you can uh, stay away for food for a while, you feel very strong. You feel like you, you have no fear of hunger. That's what it is that you could go through any situation with no problem. <laughs> that might make you feel like that. And it's okay to reinforce your courage now and again, but don't go too far, that's what I say. As soon as you feel weak and, you know, bad or dizzy or, you know, sick or any symptom, you have to stop. Okay? Don't push it. <laughs> you can drink, of course. I have discovered that uh, many of the so-called breatharian, they don't completely go without food or drink. I thought, that's it, no more food, no more drink. It's not like that. They call themselves breatharian, or maybe they eat uh, prana or something, but they drink something. Occasionally, uh, fruit juice or cocktail, or even coffee, or sometimes they eat also soup. Yeah, they call it soup and prana. <laughs> Oh, coffee and prana. <laughs> like some people, they call themselves vegetarian, but they eat egg and fish and shrimp, and they call themselves uh, vegetarian. What they mean is a part-time vegetarian. That's why other people have to invent the word called vegan. See? Just to distinguish themselves from people who eat egg and dairy products, a lot of fish and shrimp and chicken even sometimes. I met, you know, one person who, who is breatharian, huh? And she drinks coffee and uh, that, that sometimes and fruit juice and all that. And uh, she said to me, I should go, uh, you know, prana, eating, you know, air. So I said, but I love food so much, what to do? She said, okay, so what is your favorite food? I said, Chinese. I'm <laughs> half Chinese and Vietnamese. She said, okay, then you can have Chinese food and Prana, I said, oh, what's the difference? I'm doing it right now, all my life already. <laughs> so cute and so tolerant. <laughs> and I discovered that uh, many of them are like that. Hmm? And some people just eat coconut, as he told me, and with prana, or just soup with prana. 
And the French people, they can say, oh, I'm a prana person with French baguette <laughs> and pate <laughs> and whatnot. Huh? <laughs> so it's, it's really it's not all that serious. So only a few people are truly pranic people, you know, like they don't eat anything at all. They don't even drink. They live on solar system or on air or on the the chi from the ground or from the forest and from the sun and from the air. They make use of all that. Or they live on love, on faith alone. And some people like Teresa Neumann, yes, she lives on the love of Jesus. And there was another woman I read in a book, somewhere in Russia or something. She also really a pranic person. She lives on love alone. And no cheating, no coffee, no drink, no eating anything, no soup, no liquid, no uh, juice cocktail, you know, fruit juice mix. And, that. and uh, some people in the Himalaya, they really live on air alone. Yes, and some people uh, live um, breatharian, but they drink liquid, yeah, or water, or some kind of herbal tea, yeah. Sometimes because their body needs some time because they're too bored to eat, eat nothing every day. <laughs> Without food, you can't meditate. With too much food, you also cannot meditate. <laughs> That's a problem. But you're doing good. Hi, Master. I did try uh, to go with that uh, food, but uh, for two weeks, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But not like totally um, you know, without food, just one, just with some fruit. But then, um, I feel, like you said, really light. But when I say without food, I mean really without food. No fruits, nothing. Because I didn't want to go too fast. You do what you want. Yeah, you do what you feel good, okay? So I just think we'll be natural and it's fine, yeah? Just be natural. Do whatever you like, okay? If you can do without food, do without food. If you cannot, then do with food. If you can eat less, eat less. Okay? Yes. If you can eat more, uh, stop it. <laughs> <laughs>
So um, I decided to go on with this work. What kind of work are you doing? I mean, what kind of people you're connecting and what, how do you do that? I'm standing in a position from um, 30 uh, centimeters and I'm um, signing lines about on the uh, body. Are and they vegetarian or have they become vegetarian because of that? No, this is the second work I'm doing. I'm uh, explaining a lot about uh, raw food because I eat um, vegan raw food. I saw on TV, I saw you together with uh, Dr. Gabriel Cousins, this famous uh, medical doctor. He has a center in the Arizona. And I read his book many years ago and uh, I was going very alone this way and um, now I'm eating almost raw food and I'm doing workshops about the raw food eating. I'm asking about the people you're dealing with. Have they turned to be vegetarian or vegan or raw? That means no meat diet. Um, Have they turned? Have they become different in that way? Have you helped them to become animal-less um, eater? This was not the, the subject in this. Oh, so what should be the subject? Mm -hmm. What for you connect them with anybody and then they continue doing the way they do? I hope that I connect them with their inner wisdom and it's going um, somehow that they feel that they are not on the right way. So. Um, after the work, mostly I have no contact with the people. It's like setting them on the right way and then letting them go. So I, I'm not looking uh, if they change their food. This is my uh, second job I'm doing with workshops. And I'm not always bringing together these two subjects. But mm. I know that it's very important but I feel that they are connected with their inner heart again. I'm working many years about the, um, the vegan raw food things, and every time when I give the, the people too hard rules, they w will break them. And the only thing I do is um, to live it and to show the people it's possible. And um, everywhere, I'm working as a physiotherapist. This is my job where, where I gain money. Mm. And sometimes it's very hard because all the, the people come with all this stuff about the, um, their joints and the back pain and all this thing. Mm. Mm. And I'm telling all about the vegan raw food and all mm. these things. You have to be at least to the middle level of okay. the third in order to even be uplifting people or connecting people. This work is coming from a medical doctor. He is uh, telling the people about this reconnective feeling. So I was not sure um, from where does this work come and so I wanted to ask you. What you're doing is just standing and thinking positive and project it to people, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. This is a wish for imagination. It is good to think positive and to wish that it happen, but it's one more thing to make it really happen. You see, when I connect you with the light, you see the light. When I connected you with the sound, you hear the sound. I'm not imagining sending you anything. <laughs> I just awaken your own nature inside, and it's proven immediately. And that is a true connection. Anything else is just wishful thinking. It might be good to think positive, why not? But it's not necessarily always helping that person that you wish to help. You do what you do, it's fine. Okay, thank you. But uh, do not always imagine that you're really healing that person or connecting him in any mm -hmm. way. You can yeah. wish to do that, of yeah. course, but do not imagine that truly it would have happened. It doesn't because they don't turn into a vegetarian diet. They haven't been turned back into compassionate cells. So how would they heal themselves? I mean, how would they progress or reconnect themselves? I saw that many people change after the reconnection. Change so, a little bit, yeah. maybe. No smoking, but that people sm quit smoking outside without you anyway. 
A lot of people quit smoking now. You saw it on television, like after the smoking ban, 40,000 people quit in Scotland or wherever that was. Actually, it's, uh, without anybody doing anything, people quit smoking anyway sometimes. Perhaps that doctor, he has the power, but maybe you don't have that, or uh, very less power than he does. But anyway, it's very good to think positive, and it's all right. Just do not feel too much like it is a reality and feeding your ego with it and harming your spiritual progress. So on what can I do to rise my level? You just do your job as a doctor. Okay. Physical therapy, you do whatever help people. If it helps, it's fine. <laughs> okay, but thank uh, you. not by imagining that people will be connected, then they will be connected. The result speaks for itself. Normally, it's like that. Thank all you. right, love. So it's okay. You do what you do, all right? <laughs> yes. Pray to the God grace so that you don't come down with them. Of course, it's difficult to distinguish between the true and the less true. Huh? And so, of course, you're trying to help the way you think is helping. But it's not truly helping. But nevertheless, it's doing no harm. It might be harmful to you because you believe that you have that capability, and no, you don't. So it will be deducted from your spiritual merit. And that was all there is. It's not like I forbid anything at all. It's just whatever I say to the people, it's happened, it's proven. Like I say, I, you have the light and the music within you. I can awaken it for you, and it is true like that. So whatever I say to you, is, it is proven. And even I say the climate change and all that, it's also been proven afterward with the scientific evidence. I don't want to say anything like, okay, I'm sending my positive power to you. Now feel good, feel happy, hula, no thing like that, you know. <laughs> I do things truthfully. So whatever we have, we say we have. That's, I think, the safest way. Whatever we don't have, we say we don't have. I have how much money, I spend how much. I don't try to use my positive thinking. Imagine I have a billion in the bank. So anyway, um, it's just my way of uh, saying that we should uh, do what we are really capable. And knowing that is capable. If we don't know it, then we don't do it. And not by believing only or not by hearsaying or not by imagination. We have many different paths of practice, yes. And the Kuan Yin method, practitioners will heal himself or herself and heal other people anyway, automatically. Depends on how high level you practice, without even laying hand on anybody, without even looking at him, without even knowing that person. Sometimes you just pass by a person, you give him some healing power already. So this is the best healing, the way Jesus did. He healed and without knowing. He said, your faith had healed you. He never said that I rise the dead, I cure the blind. There are other people who said it, because it was true. It happened by his spiritual power, but he never proclaimed it. And many people say they were healed after practicing Kuan Yin Method or by meeting me, but I myself have never proclaimed it because it just happened. I knew it would happen. It's from universal power, and it's good for them. But uh, I don't proclaim anything as a healer or anything per se. So the thing is, if people practice Kuan Yin Method, that's the best for them. They become their self-doctor. Even many, you see, the cancer is there, and the next day it's not there, and the doctor doesn't know what to do. <laughs> Already in the operation table and cannot find the cancer anymore. <laughs> Overnight or over a week, it disappears. And so the person has to get out of the table and go home. <laughs> yeah, it's, it happened like that. It's because they turn into their compassionate nature self, their self-healing nature. This is the best healing for everybody. So if you try to practice more in Kuan Yin Method, you'll be an automatic healer. But if you prefer to continue your way, it's okay too. If it's by your good heart, you want to do that. I will not forbid or anything, never. 
You are free. You are free spirit, free soul. <laughs> you do what you want. You do what you feel is right. Yeah, but sometimes we have to pay for what we do, if it's not correct, or if it's too much from our earning. Like we want to give 10,000, but we have only five in the bank. Then we have to borrow 5,000 more to give, due to our good heart. <laughs> That's okay too, <laughs> why not? You do what you feel is right. But the thing is, we as one in practitioner heal people in any case, by our own spiritual merit. The higher level we are, the more healing power we have. Yeah, good luck with your job. <laughs> Be loving and good to your patient, and that is okay. You are very loving and kind to your patient, and it's good. Yeah, I wish you good, and I wish your patient well as well. But the fact is they haven't changed too much, apart from maybe stop smoking. <laughs> they should stop meat eating as well. That would do them the world of good. You emphasize on that, okay? I watched that um, friends of mine, they are working also with this reconnected feeling. They did the course um, by this medical doctor. And the first time they made this course uh, with him, they had much power and uh, healing happened. Like what kind of power? A friend of mine, she was at home and a patient um, was in the hospital, in the uh, intensive hospital, and um, the daughter called that my friend should give her a, uh, a distant healing. And she was sitting in her chair, and after two distant healings, the, the man um, said he can hear always the words in his head, um, stand up and go home, you're healed. Mm -hmm. And this man didn't have contact with spiritual things before. And the, um, the wire he had in his stomach after the operation, mm. it was going out of his stomach. And the, the medical doctor can't explain this. I don't mean this. I don't mean they don't have power. Yes, but there are two, three kinds of power. How long can you heal this person? For example, you heal him today, if he doesn't change his way of life, he gets sick again and double trouble mm -hmm. because the interest rate. What you don't pay the bank today, you pay tomorrow. And the longer you prolong your payment, the more interest you will pay. The only healing power, lasting and real, is come from ourselves by being compassionate and true and noble. That's the only lasting healing power, not the borrow one. So, for example, one of you gets sick or something like that. She don't need to tell me nothing. I don't need to sit on the chair and do healing section or nothing. It's just automatic. Yes, okay? That's one thing. I don't even need to know about it. From where does this uh, healing energy come then? I I want to understand this from the stories I told you. They came from astral power. Okay. I have told you at the time of initiation, when you reach astral level, you have many magical power. You could even uh, manifest things, give it to people. You could disappear, you could go through war and all that. If you're at it very intensively, you have all kind of magical power you can imagine. But this is not the goal okay. of uh, our practice. The goal is to reach ourselves again, to have a complete power that we have, not just astral power, not just second level power, but the complete power, that we are that. Healing power is just one aspect of our being. And if we concentrate on that alone, then we don't go a little further than that. The last thing to understand it completely, um, when people come and want to have this reconnection, mm. and I know that it's not the I that it's giving, can this harm me or can this um, somehow um, hinder me to follow my path to go on the next level? It's very difficult to, <laughs> to understand that it's not I, the one who do it. 
since uh, somebody will sit in the chair and then send some distant healing. It's difficult to deny the ego of the outcome of it. It's difficult to tell the mind that it's not I who sit in the chair, it's not I who send the power. <laughs> you know, it's very difficult for the ego to accept that. And if you can do that, and it's fine for you. Okay. I wish you good luck. Thank you very much, Master. Yeah. But I would not really recommend. But you are free, as I said already. The Buddha has the most powerful magician <laughs> called Moggallana in Sanskrit. Moggallana, the one that we have celebrated recently in the festival of uh, Ulamba, the one who could go to hell and visit his mother in hell, the one who could go to different level of heaven and check out different planet. And when he died, it was because of his magical power. And the people who lost in the battle of magical power with him, because they have less power than he did, they kill him by some physical mean, not by magic. So anyway, the Buddha have warned him not to keep showing the magical power to outside people. Don't let other people know about it and should not use it at random. But he did not listen. <laughs> he went out and compete and all that. So later on, he incurred a lot of enmity. And that's how he died. Well, his soul will be rescued by Buddha, of course. There's no problem about that. But what I mean is, Magical power is not the safest way to rely on, eh? Put it that way. He could even go to the hell eh? because his mother treated the Sangha, I mean the assembly of the Buddha, very badly. According to the story, she even cheated them. She put meat in the food and all that because she knows they are vegetarian, but she cheated them and all that, all kind of bad things she did. And she looked down upon the Sangha, the practitioners, like you are right now. Not necessarily the monk only. Whoever practiced the Kuan Yin method with the Buddha at that time, she looked down upon. So she has to go to hell. And she could not even eat anything in hell, keep burning fire all the time. And uh, Moggallana is a powerful magician. He has a lot of magical power. He can even go to that hell. Nobody could be allowed to go there, you know, alive even. He was still alive, and he went to hell to visit his mother because he knows his mother is suffering greatly in hell without food and hungry and get burned all day or night. So he went there to try using his magical power to manifest some food and give it to her. But every time the morsel reached her throat, it become turned into burning coal due to her bad karma. Because anything you do to a true spiritual practitioner is the greatest sin you can ever do. If you kill a normal person, it is already very, very grave. But if you cheat or insult the Sangha, I mean the true practitioner, like the Kuan Yin Method practitioner, who is truthful, who is virtuous, who is vegetarian, and who is meditating of peace and kindness and everything like that, if you harm any of these persons, even Jesus say, shake the dirt out of your feet in front of any of the house who treated you like badly. Shake the dust off your feet from that house because they're going to be really in hell, in a terrible uh, retribution. So Moggallana, his mother was so terrible that she treated all the monks and the disciples with disdain and very, very uh, disrespectful and bad to them, and make them eat meat and all that when she gives them offering. So anyway, uh, so she has to go to hell, burning hell like that. And even her son is a disciple of the Master. Buddha cannot even help, because she knows it and she did it. Not like she doesn't know and ignorant. She knows everything, and she did the contrary. So that was her retribution. And even her son, who is so powerful in magic, cannot help her. He could even manifest food in hell, in the hungry hell, 
He manifests food right there and give it to her. He's very powerful. One of the uh, foremost disciples of the Buddha, the close disciples, and a monk, so virtuous and so good, still cannot help the mother because she was too bad, too bad. She uh, harmed the true practitioner, that's why. And so after he knows that he's not powerful enough, so he has to go back and beg with the Buddha then. And the Buddha say it takes all the disciples <laughs> to help one mother, such a bad one. Take all the merit of all the whole Sangha assembly, the whole true practitioner assembly at that time, disciples of the Buddha, who came from a three months retreat even in the mountain. Such a powerful Sangha only then can help his mother. Mogalana has to go and buy fruit, vegetable, food, five kinds of different color fruit, not just one fruit, not just a mango or a papaya, have to have five kinds. The Buddha lists it all. And he has to wait until what day, what month, that all the retreat monks and Sangha, the true practitioner, came out to see the Buddha out of the retreat. That time they are powerful. After the summer retreat, they are very powerful, full of <laughs> blessing and full of store of merit and divine power. And he has to offer all of this to all of them. He must have been working day and night then as a monk. Uh, he must have got a, a part-time job or something after that. Because being a monk, how he has all this money, you know? He must have gone out and worked. Then. Because you cannot go back for that, you have to buy it by yourself. And so the whole list the Buddha gave him, what to do, what to do, what to do, and offer to whom and whom and whom. And then, mother was saved. Can you imagine? That's why I keep telling you guys, magical power is not the way. It's good for a little bit fun. And it's uh, maybe postpone some sickness or misery, postponing, delaying, but you cannot uh, bribe the Lord of Karma. <laughs> it has to be from inside. You have to be good. Then you can be healed forever, now and hereafter. Are you happy with my answer? But conclusion, you do what you want, what your heart feels good. But I'm just telling you the information. Except you don't eat meat, you don't drink <laughs> alcohol, you don't smoke, you don't drug. <laughs> And you meditate. Everything else you do at your cost. Can you say stories? Now, that when you say that when you have the power and then you don't want to know you have that power. So I read, uh, it's a really beautiful story. I only read a bit. I don't know much about him, but yeah. he was saying that he didn't want to know. So always his shadow was healing and, and doing the miracles. I thought it was so beautiful when uh -huh. I read it. I said, oh, that's so okay. nice. An interesting thing is um, sometimes I have migraine, and then when I'm doing the sound, it's totally gone. But then, unfortunately, when it ends, and then the migraine comes back. Sometimes. Uh, yes. continue for a while. <laughs> I'm not asking. It's nothing I know, to, I know, to I know. heal, you it's know what I mean? Automatic. It's interesting. Maybe it one day will be different. And then it's, it'll be gone forever. Keep doing, and then one day it'll be gone for good. It won't yes. even come back. Bear a little bad karma that you have right now. Okay. And do as much quanning as you can. Of course, uh, proportionally, yes. the sound and the light. Do as long as you can. Okay. And then with the time, it'll be gone. Well, thank yeah. God it's only some time you have migraine, not all the time. Yes, I, I, I don't understand. have all the time. It's only very interesting thank how God. such a painful pain can go just by doing the sound yes, meditation. Yes. And then sometimes you would not do it because you were in pain and you said, oh, you know, I How can sit I do, down it? And do yes. it? But it's the opposite. It's the opposite. It's the op yeah. Just try to do it and then the result will come immediately. Mm -hmm. I told you many times. Mm -hmm. I don't tell lie to you. I tell only the truth. Not just migraine, but that is the, the most revealing. It's most obvious to you. You can yes, see right away. Yes. Anything else you don't see very well. You know, yeah. like sometimes you have hidden cancer you don't know yet. And it's also gone before the doctor even know it, mm -hmm. before you even know it. 
It heals so many things in your body, not just to talk about spirit. But you don't know it because you don't know. Yes. <laughs> not just a migraine. It's just a migraine. It's so obvious that you know immediately. That's See? true. Yes. yes. Can I ask one other? Sure, sure, of course, of course. It's about the wisdom that we are talking before the wisdom and practicing the Kuan Yin. You develop your wisdom. Sometimes you get a bit of a message or something. Yeah. And then it's so quick and then it's gone and then you lose it. And then later on, you will realize that you were in touch with that before. Uh. But um, maybe. I don't know, I'm not ready, able to get it and to use it. You got it. it, you got it, you got it. Just your brain didn't get it. Your mind didn't get it. But once you get it, you won't lose it. How you expect the brain or the mind to store all these wonderful things is out of this world for you. Okay. Once you get it, you get it. You just want to hold on to it in the brain. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. What you get, you get. It's good. It will be adding, adding until you're completely enlightened. Mm. Okay? Yeah. But uh, you already progress as much as our brain can capish. That's the thing. Everything else is just belonging to the higher sphere and it's difficult for us to calculate here. That's why sometimes you, you feel like you're still not yet that intelligent the way you want. But you are. Don't worry. What I'm dealing with is just your ego. Not you, but I mean everybody sometimes. I have to cut it as much as I can. Right now, the Americans already worry about their shortage of water. The glacier has melted a lot, more than usually, so only a little bit left on the top of some mountain in the western of the United States of America. And the river has become drier, and they predict that uh, in a few more years only, couple more years, the water might not be even enough for 23 million people who depend on that water to survive. Can you imagine? It's not happening in Africa. It's not happening in some dry desert country. It's happening even in the United States already and in Australia and all that. We all know, right? It's just getting worse and worse now, and I really, I don't know how to do, if I could just go out and beg everybody on the street, just please stop eating meat and stop raising stocks and stop using the resource of the earth, stop wasting water. I would do that. Okay, but the critical mass may be coming soon, and it might work by itself. And we can, we can celebrate one day that we save the planet. If people repent in their heart, and react quick enough, turn to vegetarian diet with the grace from heaven, with the interference from uh, the positive power, we might be able to save 80% of the population of the planet. Otherwise, it would be 80% of the population minimum would be gone. Instead, it would be 80% saved. Okay, I have read some Nice story. I'm going to read it to you. You like? Yes. Bedtime story, candies, uh, biscuits. This your element. <laughs> like come home to grandma, you know? <laughs> always have candies and cake. The forbidden stuff that mama say no in grandma's house. Always okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of the poems of Brummy again. He always used stories to enlighten his disciples or the people of his time. Don't look at me, he said. Fall into the safety of God. I am already drowned. Do I have a beard? I can't remember, <laughs> I said. Wow, he can't even remember even if you have a beard or not. Rescue this man from his mustache. Curling so proudly, while inside he tears his hair, I mean inside his heart. Outside his mustache is cute and curl around, but inside he tears his hair, I mean he's in trouble. 
married to God, married to God, but pretending not. The mystic, they have a way to talk like this. Uh, let's read further, see if we can enlighten ourselves. We see distinctly what this imposture becomes in a hundred years. A sheikh looks into a chunk of iron like it's a mirror. What this bushy bearded man does not discover in his house, a boy could find it so easily. I'm reading yet. <laughs> Dive into the ocean. You are caught in your own pretentious beard. Like something you didn't eat. You are not garbage. Pearls want to be like you. You should be with them. Where waves and fish and pearls and seaweed and wind are all one. No linking, no hierarchy, no distinctions, no perplexed wondering, no speech beyond describing. I think somebody is trying to convert this guy, to convince him to be, uh, you know, a disciple of God, to practice spiritually. Even though he said the appearance of this guy seemed like he's happy and pretty, carefree, but inside he's full of trouble and anxiety and suffering, like most of the people who has no spiritual power within himself to rely on. That's what he meant, I guess. So now he was uh, describing to this guy with the beard and a mustache that there are such a place where it's just uh, happiness and no distinction, no perplex wandering, no speech beyond description. Rumi want to tell somebody who is pretentious, like he's just wearing a big beard and you know mustache and all that. Sometimes turban. It looks like he's uh, religious and you know like those old time when a practitioner they wear this kind of thing to distinguish themselves, uh, not for the sake of the worldly people to recognize them, but uh, to to distinguish themselves from others so that their like-minded people can recognize them. In the old time, it's not easy to be openly a practitioner, and like what happened to Jesus and his disciples, or, or Prophet Muhammad and his disciples, and the Buddhas, and Guru Nanak, all the six Guru and his disciples. They have always been persecuted, so they had to always hide and practice in, uh, in hiding, yeah, in secret. You know all that already. So in the old time, perhaps, the sick people, they have like five belongings to distinguish themselves for each other. Like they have a comb, a bangle, <laughs> a turban, a short, etc., etc. And nowadays we have an initiation card. So in the old time, they have many different things to identify themselves. Like the Muslim, they have the shawl yeah, around them and the prayer mat, thing like that. I guess in such a country like dry desert country, it is more convenient also to carry it around your head to cover your nose and all that. So the sand will not enter your nose. Hmm? Also, in the old time, they have to be secretive. So when they go out, they do cover their face a little bit. <laughs> so people don't recognize who they are when they walk on the street of the group meditation. In the old time, it's worse. In the old time, you have nowhere to go to hide. Today, at least, maybe if this country is not free, you go to another country. There are some countries who are more free than others. America and Americans people, they are still very, very free to some extent compared to other countries who you cannot even talk anything about your faith or your religious belief. And this is really terrible. For the 21st century, you cannot believe it still happened. 2,000 years after they crucified Jesus, they still not have enough religious freedom everywhere in the whole world. 
America is still a very, very free country. I have to say it fairly and justly like that. And here also we have freedom. Hmm? England, we have freedom. As long as we do not do anything that violate the law, you can congregate, you can have your faith, you can have belief the way you want, and you do much of the thing that you want, which is very, very, very good. But again, I guess you guys earn it also, hey? Eh? It come all down to karma, no? <laughs> very good, good karma, good karma. So up to now, Rami or whoever that is holding a conversation in this poetry was trying to tell the guy with the pretty mustache and long beard that there is a place where you don't need to argue anymore, no more intellectual wrestling. It's just nice and cool, happy, simple. That is the place of heaven, the kingdom of God, that he was trying to tell him. But he don't want to mention kingdom of God because some people are allergic to that. <laughs> they may say, no, I don't want kingdom of God. I want nirvana. <laughs> What's wrong with my nirvana? <laughs> if he's a Buddhist, he may say that. <laughs> so he tried to avoid the religious terminology here, just like Buddha also tried to avoid the name of God, the terminology God. And then people would say, oh, the Buddha, he doesn't believe in God. Nonsense. What is he practicing all these years for? Yes? <laughs> what was he looking for? He didn't even know about Buddha nature. Yeah? So what was he looking for? The belief that there is something larger than life out there, up here. Everyone who practices a spiritual path believes there is a creator. There's a great almighty somewhere. Now... This guy was trying to reason with him in a poetic way, in a very casual way. Tried to avoid mention religion and God. Up to now, probably this guy keeps listening. Yeah, at least if he doesn't mention religious terminology, then he's still listening. So we don't see here that he's answering him or arguing back and forth, nothing. And then he continued. Either stay here and talk, or go there and be silent. Go where and be silent? Yes, go to that place where there's no more intellectual wrestling, where everything is quiet, no wondering, no speech, beyond description. That's the place that he wants this guy to go. He say, okay, either you just stay here. Uh, you know, all the theory and the doctrines and... Oh, the, you know, description of our past, the master experiences when you have nothing at all. It's like you're talking about apple and you never saw it, you never eat it, you never taste it, you never know what it's like. So he said, okay, either you stay here and blah, blah, <laughs> or go there and be silent. Oh, he's talking like this, we understand, but the poor guy with the beard, I don't know how much longer he can bear him. <laughs> so let's see, he keeps listening now. At least he's not arguing. So, or do both by turns. Ah, we see some tolerance, flexibility. Of course we do both, no? We don't always talk about theory. We don't always uh, explain in the doctrine or telling jokes and stuff. We also meditate and we get in touch with the divine within ourselves. So he say, or do both. Uh, thank you very much, can we? <laughs> Sure. Do both by turns, he said. Yeah, so sometimes we talk about the Bible and Noah and all this, but we don't always do that. Yes? And of course, if I tell you, sit here 24 hours nonstop, no eating, no drinking, no talking, no listening to all the expounding of the, the scripture, then you also cannot bear. Right? So we do it by turn. That's correct also. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. With those who see double, talk, double talk. Hmm. Make noise, beat a drum, think of metaphors. With friends, say only mystery. Near roses, sing. He means to the people who only talk theory and 
uh, preaching empty words, then you just ha-ha with them, <laughs> talk double with them, and do whatever they do. Fine, we'll be friends with them, so that we don't have conflicts in the world. But with friends, talk only mystery. You know what that means. Ah, uh, yes. Between us, sometimes we talk about things that other people might not understand. Something for disciples only. You should blend in with people, talk their talk, work their work, but stay true to yourself. And whenever you between the friends, then you talk differently. You talk mystery only. I mean, talk about God only, about the incredible, mysterious power that everybody possesses, but they don't know about it yet. So he say, only with friends can you talk about these things. I mean, the initiated, same-minded people, the practitioner. But with outside people, hey, you make noise like they do, <laughs> you beat the drum, you sing, you do whatever. He say, near roses sing. Roses mean woman, okay? If you see woman, you also praise, it's, you know, just like everybody else. Integrate so that you can protect the treasure that you have found within yourself. Because if you act differently, they might make you trouble. Now he continued teaching him how to live in this world as a spiritual practitioner, but appear as anybody else. He said, with deceptive people, cover the jar and shield it, but be calm with those in duality. Speak sweetly and reasonably, patience polishes and purifies. With the people who are not honest, like the non-practitioner in this period of time, they are deceptive, they are not uh, truthful, they are not honest and they might be even dangerous to them, as you know well, in, during the time of uh, Prophet Muhammad, they have to hide and they have to run, they have to defend themselves and risking their lives and everything. So he said, with deceptive people, cover the jar and shield it. What kind of jar that you have to cover and shield? Your spiritual knowledge, your treasure within. Don't show it to people. Even nowadays, I still tell you, don't go out and boast about your spiritual vision. Yes? You never know who is who, so keep quiet. Yeah? Also, this is a gift of heaven. Mostly gift from heaven, we should treasure it and keep it within ourselves. That's why Jesus said, pray in the closet. Keep quiet. Everything that you have been given, it's not from this world. You cannot show it here, except to the one that understands, to the one who is ready for such a gift, just like you. That's why he said you have to cover the jar, shield it even. Not just cover it, but hide it, protect it. So treasure, you know, <laughs> more than diamonds. So he said, for the people who are still in duality, I mean, the people who are still in the quagmire of ignorance of the duality, yeah, the yin and the yang, they are still in it. Be calm, be patient with them. He said, patience polishes and purifies. So if you're patient with these people who are still trapped in duality nature of the creation, of the Maya existence, you be calm. Be patient with them, and then it will polish and purify them at the end. And it will gradually bring them to where you want them to be. So that is just the advice for a new comer, new initiate of his time. For this, I am sure, Rami must have had some disciples. He must have been a master. Not just a poet, not just a mystic poet, but he was a master. He was teaching disciples. Because this is the thing that a master would say to a disciple. This is the thing that people would say, like Kwan Yin Method practitioner would say to each other, the old one tell the new one. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah. Or the teacher tell the newcomer. We were talking about Guru Amadas, who was already 72 years of age when he met his master. And his master is who else but his own brother next door. <laughs> All this time, <laughs> waited until he's 72 years old, doesn't even know where <laughs> the God man lives. Because most people take things for granted. In India, I knew one of the master. He never let any disciples stay longer than six months. So anyway, this is the typical things of the mind. Whatever is too near, you cannot see very well. And uh, whatever is easy, we think is not valuable. Suppose some stone would be as rare as diamond, then we'll be paying for it <laughs> more than diamond. And I heard that they collected diamonds, a lot of them, but they hide them first. <laughs> so it's not in abundance, because if it is in abundance, maybe people will want it cheaper. Then how come Guru Angad, even though he's his brother, but uh, why do you think he gave him initiation at the age of 72? Most uh, of the time, 60, 65 is the maximum. Tell me, anybody knows? Why so old can still get initiation? Huh? All the wise Buddha sitting there? Sincerity? Sincerity? Mm, well, everybody is sincere <laughs> at that age. <laughs> I'm sure he knows what he wants already. <laughs> If at that age <laughs> you still uh, like, uh, dilly dally about whether you should get initiation to save yourself or not, <laughs> I don't think we can ever be sincere anymore. <laughs> huh? At that time, you should be very lucky if somebody gives you initiation, <laughs> sincere or not. Family member. Family member? <laughs> Are there such thing in a guru's house? No. No family member stuff. Even his daughter want to see him and had to wait until he calls. And even already uh, feeling adventurous due to the sincerity of that old man, she still say, you stay here, I go get his permission first. So the, the master must have been very strict. Yeah. Well, that's the only thing to, to really keep the disciple in discipline, you know? because we are so unruly. We get used to with being unruly like a horse without direction already, running all over like a wild horse already. And if you come to a guru and your guru also say, oh, never mind, do what you want, <laughs> then you never do anything, yeah? You go to the beach, you come home, you sleep, and then you go eat, you go back, sleep again. You will not meditate that much. Uh, maybe his inner level is high. Inner level is high? Okay, perhaps, but that's not it, yeah? Destiny. Destiny? Oh, well, maybe. What else? He's already trained. Trained? By whom? <laughs> By experience. Life experience. Life experience. Oh, God, it does take a long time until 72. <laughs> Goodness sake. <laughs> Life experience. 
Aren't we all? Even the, the people are yearning, but 72, they're 72, no? Maybe it's an already a vegetarian house, the that. Ah, yeah, that would be it, I guess, yes. Because that's the minimum requirement, no? Yeah. And mostly when people are too old, it's difficult for them to adopt vegetarian diet. Maybe cannot. And uh, in India, it's not the same. He can drag his old body from <laughs> Punjab all the way up to the pilgrimages, and 20 of them. <laughs> so uh, he could sit long also, <laughs> I guess. He's healthy. He has been vegetarian all his life. Indian, many of them are vegetarian, majority. Until later on, we have other kind of religions come in, so people became less vegetarian people. The tradition has been a little bit wavering. Otherwise, before, most Indian people are vegetarian. So he must have been vegetarian all his life. And he's such a healthy guy, climbing 20 pilgrimages. <laughs> and all the time, he's living nearby his brother, who's a God-realized person, and he could not realize it. And his nephew's wife always reciting something, and he has never paid attention, reciting the, the Holy Scripture. And he has never paid attention until then. Mm. So I guess his time is up. And what a long time he has to wait. You lucky. How old are you? 47. 47? You look like 20. <laughs> so young, no wrinkle, nothing. Yeah. Yeah, good skin. Mm. I've seen you for 20 years now, and she looked the same like yesterday. You practice well, you stay young long. Before you came here, there were two Taiwanese came in here, before I even came. So I came and see them. Everybody tried to help in different ways. The guys who know electricity, check out the sockets and all that. And the guys who know how to connect to television, do climbing on the roof, <laughs> setting the disc. Everybody's doing something and uh, make the road, plant the trees and buying stuff. Everybody helped, so it gone quickly. Now, these two gentlemen, one of them, of course I know them long time already, almost since the beginning in Taiwan, a mission. So we were talking, joking, you know, like who is young around here. And then <laughs> we were running to do something. And then he began to breathe a little bit harder. I say, what's up, young boy? <laughs> he say, I'm 74 already. <laughs> of course, I must know that, but I forgot. I forgot how time flies. And I knew him uh, like almost 20 years or something. At that time, he's only 50-something. And now he's 74, I can't believe it. He doesn't look 74 at all. Of course, he's a little bit more developed over here, <laughs> like most of the old men. But I, I couldn't believe he's 74 already. He looked just like before. I can't believe it that he's 74. Still look very healthy, good skin, pinky, and do a lot of stuff. And some of the Vietnamese in uh, L.A., when I met them again, you know, last time, they say they're 70-something. I say, what? Really? Because she doesn't look like that. It's impossible to tell. So I say, my God, what the secret? And she say, I meditate very well, Master. <laughs> she said, very diligently. This story, it's uh, about a girl who fell into the house of prostitution. Just to let people know that uh, no matter where you are, if you are a saint, you are a saint. And that we should not judge a saint for where they are or what they appear to do. Sometimes they appear to be like this, like that, or appear to do this, to do that. But in their soul, they are clean like the lotus in the mud. There was a, a great, a renowned saint, a lady saint. Her name is uh, Rabia 
she was very beautiful uh, when she was a young girl. And because of her beauty, she was at one time abducted by thieves who sold her to the owner of a house of prostitution, where she was expected to do as every other woman living in that same house. On the first night in her new surrounding, a man was brought to her room, and she immediately entered into conversation with him. She said, Ah, it is good to see such a nice young man. Please make yourself comfortable in that chair while I pray a little. If you like, you may also pray with me. <laughs> Go in the prostitute house. <laughs> pray with me. <laughs> you think the man still have any mood after that? <laughs> she does know what to do. The young man was surprised. <laughs> of course, he didn't expect such an attitude from such a place like that. So he was very surprised. But he knelt down on the floor beside Rabia, and both of them prayed for some time. This is India. And no matter who you are in India, if you are an Indian, you brought up from childhood already to know something about God, about prayers, no matter what religion. In India, up to date, most religions, they live side by side together and has no problem. The reason they have any problem, maybe not always due to themselves, but due to some outside influences. Some people want to make a profit uh, from some turbulence for whatever their convenience or whatever their interest. And some people are naive and listen to them, and then the fight between brother broke out. It's similar everywhere, it's like that. It started very small, somewhere, and then it became bigger and bigger and bigger. And the more uh, people fight, the more both sides die or wounded, then the more of escalation of the hatred between them. And then it will just continue like that. This is India. So it was very good that she behaved like this, and even the men enter in that house, but they would listen. After the prayers, Rabia got up and said, I am sure you will not mind if I remind you that you must die one day. <laughs> <laughs> the guy came in for pleasure, and what did he have to do? First he has to kneel there. His knees already tired, <laughs> and then now he has to remember that he will die one day. <laughs> what a pleasure! <laughs> and she continued, to be fair to you, it is only right that I tell you that the sin you have in mind will lead you into the fires of hell. Oh, it's getting worse all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Poor guy, he had tried to forget before he came in, and now she aired it all out. Please, for your own sake, consider if you wish to commit the sin and thus jump into the flaming inferno, or if you would prefer to avoid this fate. So the man is already like the instant noodle in the boiling water. <laughs> So it was very soft <laughs> and very, very obedient, kind of. So he said to her, Oh, good and pious lady, you have opened my eyes. And the young man was surprised and said this. And he continued, Which always before were closed to the meaning of this sin. I have promised earnestly never to visit a house such as this again. So many poor young girl has been forced into such a situation which they feel regretful all their life later, and sometimes even harmful to their health and their soul and their spirit and everything, make them lose their confidence, 
their virtue and everything. It's a bad house. Most women, they don't enter there by choice, just circumstances. Maybe during the war, I have no money, or some accident happened, a family run down, or somebody forced them into it or kidnapped, and then put them into some strange country that had no means to go out, or they don't know anything else what to do. And then sometimes they even force them to have drugs and all that, they become addicted, and they have to continue to fit the addiction as well. You saw some of them in some films. It's really pitiful. Some of the tragic tolls of addictive drug abuse. Over 200,000 deaths each year. Costs of 181 billion US dollars each year in the United States. 33 billion US dollars in the UK. Lifetime cost of current drug addiction amounts to 575 billion US dollars in the UK. Harmful effects, brain damage, stroke, heart disease, liver disease, tuberculosis, emphysema, cancer, depression, suicide, permanent memory loss, mental illness, higher infant mortality, increased crime and violence, impotence. Crime and violence. Illegal drugs are a factor in 50% of burglaries in the United Kingdom each year. In the U.S., 60% of people arrested each year have been taking illegal drugs. 650 heroin addicts in the U.S. committed 70,000 crimes in a three-month period. Social costs. U.S. businesses lose 100 billion U.S. dollars per year due to employees' drug and alcohol abuse. Australians pay 53 billion U.S. dollars per year for health care, law enforcement, and lost productivity of drug users. Environmental costs. Every gram of cocaine produced destroys 4.4 square meters of rainforest, with 300,000 hectares of rainforest lost each year to cocaine production. Death. 52 people die each day due to drugs in the U.S. In Canada, substance abuse is attributed to 21% of total deaths and 23% of potential life years lost due to early mortalities. Plus more. For more urgent information, please visit www.suprememastertv.com forward slash killers. So please, if you see such a girl in such situation, do not... Uh, make her feel worse by looking down upon her or saying things that it are hurtful to her. She is still a woman inside, very respectful, and still has Buddha nature in there, and God is still in there. And so you heard the story that Jesus has forgiven one prostitute. So as the days passed by, as we expected, many other men were brought to Rabia's room and one and all were changed, as she had changed the first one. The tradition continued. <laughs> she changed one man after another. So it was only natural that the ruffian who owned the house soon began to notice and wonder, how is it that whoever visits this girl once never returns? <laughs> The owner of the brother was puzzled and said to himself like that. And he kept thinking, she is so young and beautiful that the man should hover around her like moths around a flame. But how come they never came back? So, In order to try to solve the mystery, the wife of the brother owner one night hid herself in a place where she could see into Rabia's apartment and discover how she treated those who were taken <laughs> into it. Good evening, friend, and welcome. Rabia began as soon as the man was shown to her room. <laughs> Here in this evil house, <laughs> I always remember God. And God is omnipresent. It is an excellent idea. Don't you agree that we should remember God? 
and that God is omnipresent. So the man uh, utterly surprised at such an approach, of course has to uh, agree with her and saying that, yes, yes, we were taught that by the priests. So he has to admit that God is omnipresent everywhere. So she continued, here, surrounded by evil, I never forget that he sees all evil done and metes out even justice. Oh, how many who enter this house for a moment of so-called pleasure go through indescribable agony and suffering in God's hell because of it. You too may do the same if you wish to. But friend, the human form was bestowed upon us to enable us to meditate and realize God and not to waste the precious gift in acting even lower than the animals. Or the animals, when they have each other as partner, they respect each other and in love and they stay with each other, but they don't do this sort of thing. This man <laughs> and has so many others saw at once the truth of Rabia's words, realizing for the first time the enormity of the sin that he had in his mind. He fell prostrate at Rabia's feet and weeping bitterly begged for her forgiveness. Should do. A woman's body is also a temple of God. One should not trade it for anything, least of all the money. Selling, buying like an object, that is not the way we should treat each other. That's not the way of a gentleman. It's not the way of a human at all. This is really below animal standard. And <laughs> she's right, yes. Rabia's words were so sincere and persuasive, indeed, that even the hardened brother's owner's wife came out of her hiding and began to weep for the many sins she had committed. Now, we must know that is not just the words that had been spoken by this saintly woman, but it's because of her saintly quality that her spoken word is sincere and true. Therefore, it touched the heart of this uh, customer as well as the owner of the brothel because she means everything she said and she lived by it. So she came out of her hiding place, the wife of the brother's owner. Oh, pure and pious girl, she said, kneeling at Rabia's feet, the owner and the customer, <laughs> kneeling in front of this young girl just by a few words that she has spoken. This is the power of your purity, of your sincerity, of a very unwavering heart. She has God in her heart, and so God protects her. So whatever she spoke came from God through her mouth. That's why it is so powerful. It's not like every woman can convince these kind of people immediately like that. Besides, this is also India. Whatever they do, at least they have something in their DNA, in their tradition, in the air of India, that people should be morally acceptable, should be pious, should be virtuous, even if they have forgotten. But they do understand that, if somebody reminds them, especially when that somebody is a very pious, very pure, very truthful person. She continued, What harm we have sought to do to you, you who are truly a saint. Go and leave this evil house this very moment. As for us, we can now see that we have done a dreadful thing. Our eyes are open and our lives will change. They're going to close the shop. 
good thing. That's it. That's the end of it. Beautiful story. Happy ending. Mm. <laughs> so, because she has been in there, sacrificing her reputation, purity, you know, risking her life even, being in such a place. But she turned the table around. Such a courageous, wise, and beautiful woman. That's why she has become widely known later on as a saint, I guess, from this story. Of course, all the brothers will be closed, and everybody will talk about it. And all the men who she had converted came home and tell every other man, and every other man also tell every other man, and then they keep talking, talking. And then she became very famous and revered throughout India after she quit this job. <laughs> And of course, the brother will be closed. As it were, the owner would have given her something or maybe offer all the things that they have to her or turn that into an ashram, who knows? Yes. And then whoever customer come there, they convert them into kneeling <laughs> at her feet, <laughs> repenting, and then they become her disciples, I guess. That's a very nice story. So it doesn't matter where we are. It doesn't matter what job we do or what situation we are in. God is always inside. And if we turn into that God self, then we will get out of situation. But our sincerity, of course, counts. Have to be sincere. Have to be true to what we are and what we want. India is full of Miracle story. I like it very much. Maybe every other country have also, but not to such extent, not so extraordinary like this. Some of it are very extraordinary. Like the saint, you know, 72 years old, <laughs> go and look for a master and who it is but his brother. <laughs> and then later became one of the master of one of the, you know, biggest religion on the planet. The thing is, the people who believe in religious doctrine should remember all these gurus and all this story. That is, go seek a guru. <laughs> Even their guru, seek guru. <laughs> so we have to do the same, not just worship in a book or listening to the ex-guru of the guru of the guru story, but have to seek the truth ourselves. Seek the guru within us. Uh, first, find the outside living guru, and then we will have our own guru inside. We will find our self. Our self is our master. Very nice. I like it very much. My dogs are also funny. Sometimes when I'm not too busy, I let them sleep with me in my room. They all crawl up boom, 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 on the staircase and all lay there anywhere, no matter what. They don't care about their bed anymore. They lay on the floor or whatever. Then I have to go around collecting sleeping bag or bed so that they're not too hard on the floor, you know? otherwise they don't care. They just go up and <laughs> settle down. Uh, but uh, if I move out of the room and they immediately all alert. So sometimes I have to put music so they don't hear my stepping out <laughs> of the room. But they still do. It's just that they're more calm. They love the music, you know, especially classical. And soft music, they love it. And then they just sleep. Or if they leave television on, and they sleep very quick and quiet. It's like music, a soothing. So when I'm watching TV, sometimes they come and put their nose <laughs> under my arm, you know, and I have to pet them. And then jump on lap and all that. Such a big dog like this and become a lap dog, can you imagine? <laughs> if it's a poodle or a little Maltese, they call them lap dogs, because they can lay on your lap, they're small. But this <laughs> German Shepherd, <laughs> Great Dane, <laughs> he's standing up to here already, he wants to be lap dog also. <laughs> they copy each other, you know. <laughs> if they cannot lay uh, the whole body on top of my lap, then at least the head or something. 
I just nudge in me, so I have to pet them and put their nose under here. <laughs> so I have to know they are there. <laughs> and sometimes just snuggle around. All right, I see you. I love you very much. Yes. I know you. You really come here because you love me. <laughs> I mean, not to me, 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 but you know the the idea that we have together. You know that we are one. That's why you you want to be around me because like missing a part of the body. <laughs> but never mind. We are always together. We all know that. But we still would like to see each other. <laughs> it's funny people. We are. <laughs> I, we always say, oh, we are all one, no problem, you know. I, love is in the heart, but it's, it's not the same when, when love is all over also, not just in the heart, right? When you see each other, it's different. That's why you stay with your husband and not any other man, because you like him or you like your wife, because you like that person. Even, you know, you want together, but a physical presence is also nice. Thank you for your love every day. All right. <laughs> Don't even stop, you know, with the save the world, vegan, uh-huh. green. Uh-huh. 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 Vegan.